I think. I don't know. Chuck, are we good? This, <laughs> this day has been one interesting day. And now I've got this new freaking error message. It's not an error message on my stupid computer. It just showed up now. All right. Yeah, I'm not sure where this came from. Um, I should probably wait for some of you tech guys to, <laughs> to get on. Maybe you can, you can explain it to me. Uh, every every day it's something new. I swear to God, every day it's something new. The good news is we I think we have lined down the, the editorial issues that we are having here. Uh, too late, but uh, I, I think we are getting them lined up. With five different bodies editing projects, it should facilitate the editing process. Hopefully. How's it going, Commander Pete? Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's just been a crazy day. A good day, though. I had a nice long talk with uh, Michael Tierney. Uh, he is finished with the introduction to the Robert E. Howard uh, Collected Art uh, book thing, and uh, he's already halfway through the pulps. So he's just barreling right along. He wants to get started on layout. He's going to write as he lays out. This will be this will be challenging for the editor, who I think will be Russ, but... Uh, um, it's good news. I mean, it's good news. Uh, we are moving forward on Robert E. Howard, moving on everything. Well, that's good. Uh, yeah, I got a question for you, Babunski. Why is it here this light looks kind of normal, but in that Zoom crap I was doing for, uh, what we do, Greyhawk Con? In that, in that Zoom thing, it, it, I was all washed out. Is that is that the platform? Is that Zoom's uh, issue? Or was it uh, some kind of holy transcendence as I was on a, he returned to the world of Greyhawk <laughs> so it's Zoom so it's the Chinese software messing with us again excellent how's it going Mr. Obadiah <laughs> I'm just generally complaining about uh, the internet computers and technology what was I watching the other day they had rotary dial phones I don't know what I was watching. I was watching something and I thought to myself, ah, oh, the good old days. <laughs> Before the internet. <laughs> Before technology. <sighs> when our lifespan was 36 years. Oh, we have completely lost him. I do not know where he is. Uh, I think he got hit by a truck. Uh, he might have lost his internet. <sighs> Things have been bumpy up in the mountains. Things have been bumping down here too, but we are here. <laughs> we are here not to listen to me jabber on about the internet, but uh, for ask me anything on October sixth, two thousand and twenty. I'm trying to track Tim down. All right, there we go. I phoned him, I texted him. How's it going, Haunted Holler Fanny? How's it going, Epi? Pork chops. <laughs> I'm having ribeye tonight for dinner. I hope. I, I think I didn't pull it out of the freezer soon enough. <laughs> but there are ribeyes in the kitchen ready to be cooked either tonight or tomorrow, <laughs> depending on when they're ready. I'm pretty good excited to be kicking off a new campaign this Friday with a bunch of new Aussie players. Even had the opportunity to make a new character race or someone. Oh, very cool. What's the character race? That's awesome. Uh, CNC, I assume, or is it just an another game? I had to get Rona tested today. Oh, you got the fork up the nose, or what are they doing? They they run that <laughs> go Aussies. <laughs> are there are yeah. exactly Commander Pete? I got oh, that's no good, man. That's no good. Walking pneumonia is horrible. Um, uh, yeah, Tim had lost his internet. Yeah, don't they run the the Q-tip like into your brain pan and? Twirl your brain around or something. My wife's been tested about six times so far. A brain tickle, yes. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't look pleasant at all. Not at all. Uh, I'll be glad when we get through all this and they don't. They just quit testing people and just move on. <laughs> just, just move on. <laughs> you just, you would think with, with all of the stuff that we can do, that there would be a better way to test for the coronavirus other than jamming a Q-tip into your brain. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> exactly, Belfry. All right, well, I can't take that right now, Mike. Sorry. That's Michael Tierney. He's calling about the Robert E. Howard book. Speaking of which, I forgot to ask Peter Bradley. Um, yes, 
six. All right, there you go. <laughs> How's it going, Knight5150? Thank you for the subscription. Very much appreciated. Hey, Kadora. I hope you're having a good day. We are slowly gathering for Ask Me Anything. There's lots going on. Today's one of those days where I have found myself working on about seven different projects simultaneously, uh, which is never good because you never get any one thing done, but you get a whole lot of stuff started. Uh, and that's kind of where we are. Just one of those days. See, you see, it was an uh, oath sworn to Omnexel. Nice. A knight who was badly wounded in the Winter Dark Wars, but Omnexel brought him back. But effectively made him a human construct. Oh, that's very cool. And Omnexel is a cool deity. He actually plunged into my game, uh, in my big game, a few, about six months ago. I pulled him out after a long time. That's kind of cool. Uh, he is the evil fae, the god of the evil fae. Oh, that's very cool. I love the idea of golems. I, and I'll say this, I have only very recently become e enamored with golems. And that's because... I watched an X Files episode in season four, I think. I'm, I'm doing, I'm redoing the entire series, and I'm on season four, uh, where they meet, where they encounter a golem, and it was so much cooler than is presented in most books that I thought, well, this is actually really cool. So I immediately brought it in my game. So there you go, Mr. Obadiah. We're on the same wavelength. Not sure if that's good, <laughs> but we'll go with that. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, big danger. It's been absolutely crazy. Good, crazy. Uh, the Gaxmore thing's got me the most, uh, the most queued up right now. I'm very concerned about uh, the editing. As as many of you know, there was quite an editing snafu in, in Gaxmore, and a whole bunch of you guys jumped in. We fixed a whole lot of problems, but uh, Commander Pete, someone found about four problems this morning, uh, so that made my eyebrow go up. Uh, but I'll put that in the, <laughs> the proofing board. Yeah, it's just, it's been an interesting, uh, interesting couple of days. Uh, and, of course, we're queuing up for the, the Kickstarter that we're going to do on Monday. Trying to get as much. We're trying to get that out to as many people as we humanly can. Um, I, I really think it's got just a mountain of potential for those of us who have been in the crusade for a long time and for new people with the, the Spellbook Compendium, which we're calling the Adventure Spellbook and the, the New Player's Handbook, and then... The classes book, of which we'll have all the classes put together and all of the multi-classing and and the uh, what do we call them? Class and a half. All in one book. So it'll be three books are wrapped into this Kickstarter. One many of us have, uh, but but it'll have new art and this new cover that we're super excited about, uh, and the other two just great reference books that are there, and, and hopefully we'll kind of bring everything together. Let me roll that back. I missed a couple. If I understand the rumors on Facebook correctly, are we looking at three different products in the upcoming Kickstarter? PHB, Spellbook, Classes Book, is it going to be that huge? Yes. But all of those things uh, put together, we're going to combine right now. We have expanded classes and character classes as two books. Those, those will be combined as one book. And um, it'll have uh, the Adventurer's Backpack classes woven into the multi-classing and the uh, class and a half. So that'll all be in one jig, big, big old book. Uh, that'll be a soft cover right now. The spell book is a soft cover as well. And that'll have everything from the Adventures Backpack, the Amazing Adventures Companion, the Player's Handbook, the, the Elemental Spells, and the Player's Guide to Air, and then the Rune Mark Spells that are all scattered to hell and back again. Those will all be in that book as well. And then, of course, the Player's Handbook will have the uh, new art throughout, which uh, Zoe and Peter are hard at work on now. And uh, stuff's looking great. So I'm super excited about this one. I haven't been this excited about a, a Kickstarter in a long time. Uh, I just feel like it's it's something that we, a lot of the stuff is needed for, for quite a while. What do you think about the Wizards of the Coast latest hijinks? Yeah, I don't get, uh, you know, I, I don't get it. Whatever. I mean, <laughs> it's their company. They can do whatever they want. But these are fantasy and mythical races. They're basically, they're, what they're basically doing is taking away the unique qualities of these races and making them, you know, cookie-cutter images of the other races. And it's not, why would, if I'm going to play a kobold, I want the kobold to have its advantages and its weaknesses. That's cool. That makes it fun. It's like, <laughs> it's like when I played a gnome and he had, he had three hit points. It was just cool that he was, that's a weakness that he had, and that was okay. I played with it. 
there's no reason to make all of the races exactly alike and uh, all of that. And so I don't, I mean, it's their company, obviously, they got to do what they feel is necessary for, you know, whatever. Um, but so far as, so far as I'm concerned, I think it's a little, it's just sad that they're taking these really cool races and they're taking away their unique qualities. Uh, everything should have its unique quality. There's no reason to make everything exactly like everything else or whatever. It's just crazy. It's crazy to me. But to each his own, I suppose. You mentioned during Greyhawk Con that you you do mostly wilderness games. How does that work? Do you visit small small areas and ruins? Is city stuff handled in ha- handled in downtime? Uh, yeah. So what, what I generally will do, I'll begin wherever it begins, and I'll run it day by day, and I'll roll random encounters, or I'll have some planned. The random encounters are, are super fun because it's it's literally just something out of the book, and frequently I'll just tell someone to. Uh, I, I do. I'm still getting Skypes over here from, from people. Uh, I'll tell people to uh, to pick a page number, and then I'll go to that page number in the monster book, and that's what they encounter. Sometimes it goes well. Sometimes it goes horribly. Sometimes they're running away. But uh, a lot of it's random. Uh, this gets role-playing in. I, I get to track equipment, equipment wastage damage. Uh, I get to use the terrain as they pass. Because, you know, if you walk for five days, you can go from a forest to the plains, you know, whatever. So you can do all kinds of, of cool stuff with that. When I get to towns, we'll sometimes we'll play the towns out, just kind of depending. But I'll frequently kind of anchor them on specific members in a town, and they end up going back to that town. It becomes kind of like a base of operations, a tavern, or a, there was Innsmeet was a town forever in in my in the high level game that I'm running. It's in the dark and fold, but they mainly only interacted in the first like five levels. With the shark keeper, at the shopkeeper Charles Sands, um, named after a high school friend of mine, whose name was Charlie Sands. <laughs> but I didn't go very far from, from the pickings on that one. But um, and it was this old man that they would do jobs for him. They would go on an adventure and get this treasure and bring it back, and he'd buy it from them or trade equipment or what have you. So that NPC became kind of the anchor. They did a little bit of stuff in town. We did a few town adventures, but by and large, it's it's uh, roll day by day, uh, nighttime. You know, there's six six possible encounters in the day, six possible encounters at night. In the day, it's a one on d8, I think, a one on a d8, and at night, it's one on d12. It's something I got it written down somewhere. But uh, yeah, so it's just a lot of it's just a lot of that, and they role play with monsters, they role play with travelers, uh, come to small villages. I rarely do. They they rarely on their travels actually go to big towns. And if it is a big town, that's where your what you said there happens. We just do you know, okay in the in the town. This is what happens. You know, unless you want to role play out, you can re equip or whatever, uh, and then we move on. It's a lot of fun. I really enjoy, it. and I'll track the days. It's really kind of cool. And then when you go back through your notes after a year's worth of gaming. You've got all of these experiences, and the nice thing about it is, after a while, once you've run like ten of these games. They start to learn where the creeks are and the bridges are and where this copse is and where the barrow downs are. They become kind of like Aragorn for that that area. They know all the answers because they they trekked over all over it. So uh, it becomes a lot of fun. I, I really I, I prefer those types of games over anything. There will be dungeons, of course, in it, and they'll go like one Thursday. We'll do a dungeon that's four, five, ten rooms, and then plunder it and move on. But by and large, it's just a day by day meander. Why must people my age be so proficient at sucking the flesh? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They seem to be working pretty hard at these days. <laughs> it's a gift or a curse. Yeah, it's crazy. I don't know. It's just so funny. Re- reading some of this stuff is just weird. I don't, I don't know why we're having the reactions that we're having. I don't know. Whatever. I don't know. Uh, but I, I'm an old dude. <laughs> but I know. That class's book uh, will include stuff from Player's Handbook, Adventures Back, Back, and what else? Uh, so it's got the classes from, uh, the Hallowed, Hallowed Oracle Player's Guide, and it's got some of, does it, and it has a couple from Jason's Amazing Adventures, I think? It's got, I can't remember what's in the classes book, but I know it's the two main books, Hallowed Oracle, and I think there's a few others from another book in there that I can't remember where, uh, and I might take a look at the Haunted Highlands and put those in there as well. I gotta talk to Casey about that. Uh, but I'm sure uh, I'm sure he'd be more than happy to you know let him go in there. But 
Because he's got the witch, doesn't he? Or is that? A, I can't remember. It's been too long since I looked at HH. I think the witch. There's a few classes in Haunted Highlands. I need to. I need to check in. I'm glad you mentioned that, Mister Over. I'll, I'll, I'll rattle my cage on that. Will the Band-Aid spell be clarified? <laughs> the age. Yeah. The age spell is the only thing I know that I'm going to update, uh, and and change the nature of. No, all races must be <laughs> be the same. Otherwise, it implies that some fictional races are better than others. Which. Which I register, I guess. It's just weird. I don't know. It's just weird to me. I, and like I said, I, it's just weird. It's a cobalt. To my knowledge, it doesn't actually exist. So, <laughs> so to get too worked over, it's kind of strange. But listen, everybody's got their own thing, right? They got to do it, and they got to make themselves feel better. And, I gotta look through, and that's that's great. Uh, you won't see that in Castles and Crusades. Uh, orcs are evil. They were especially in the world of it now. I'll, let me qualify that. If you buy Castles and Crusades and you want to play Castles and Crusades and you want to make orcs have anything you want, any alignment you want, any whatever, that is up to you. God bless. Carry on. Uh, but now I will tell you in the world of Aird, they are evil. They are made of the evil thoughts of the Allfather and they are evil because of that. <laughs> they were born of evil. That's where they came from. So there are, there are no good orcs in the world of Aird. None. Uh, that's, and, and half orcs don't even really—they're in aired, but they're so very, very rare. And half orcs are they're, the only way they came about is from violence. I, I don't even like that whole concept of things. <sighs> uh, you have a unique quality. <laughs> I can't go there. Yeah, we got to stand up for the. Co- <laughs> that's all right. No, no, no. That's just weird. It sounds like a lot like hex crawling. Is this the foundation for TLG's version of the wilderness survival <laughs> guide? I would love to do a book like that. We've got a lot of that spilled in the CKG, of course. Um, because we do have now we've like I said some of it's kind of bled into things I've got all kinds of stuff that just happens boots wear out because uh, when I'm you know I'm tracking my little ticks day by day by day and, you know, cause, because I was in the army I know how quick boots and any of you who wear boots and wear them work boots wherever they wear out fast so about after three months or so they gotta get new shoes and it's just little stuff like that that kind of brings it all kind of brings it all home I think and after a while, most players kind of really start to dig it. And I haven't ever had anyone complain about the Overland um, because it's really, I don't know, it's a huge dungeon, sort of, right? With no roof. <laughs> Is that the best way to put it? Uh, I'm mosquitoist. I can't stand mosquitoes, and I don't care who knows it. <laughs> they need to all die, even with their special sneak bite. <laughs> and they even exist on my horse. Yeah, mosquitoes are really annoying. Very, very annoying. They got me the day I, I usually sit out in the evenings for about an hour and read, drink a Dr. Pepper. But somewhere in now in, in Arkansas is covered in mosquitoes. We it's mosquito country. But I hadn't we hadn't had any all June and all July and most August of just an, almost no mosquitoes. But about mid August, suddenly we were overrun with the damn things. And there's the, you're right, they got this sneak attack. These they, normally you can hear them, but I couldn't hear these guys that suddenly my elbows got four bites on it. I'm like, ah. So they have driven me from my porch and into my house, which is never good. I like to be outside, especially when it's about 110 degrees. No one will bother you. If you sit outside and read a book when it's 110 degrees outside, nobody's going to bother you. I promise you. <laughs> you can sit there and read a book. Just don't move. You know, you're going to sweat a lot. Just don't move. <laughs> and you can read to your heart's content or until you pass out from the heat, whichever comes first. Gordon, the friendly orc who helps little old ladies cross the road to sell sports get her cookies door to door. Yeah, not an aired. <laughs> not an aired. He might kill the old lady and take the Boy Scouts cookies, but that's about it. Thanks for the swag pack, TLG from Grey Out Con. Uh, no problem, Grey Pape. Uh, very cool. Uh, that was a great con. Chuck set all that up, uh, Chuck and Tim. Uh, and guy, I did absolutely nothing except show up, so uh, it was very cool. State bird of Texas is the mosquito. That's about right. I am a firm believer that while the Wilderness Survival Guide kind of sucked and was boring, there is room in the hobby for a deep and interesting presentation of overland exploration. If you do make a book like that, I've got some notes for you. Oh, that's an interesting concept. I never really thought about, you know, doing that all the way through. Uh, I always liked those two books, The Dungeoneer and The Wilderness Survival Guide. Uh, I thought they had a lot of elements that you could add to the game that weren't there previously, and they kind of codified some stuff that, you know, we were already kind of half doing anyways. Uh, but... Um, it's uh, it was they were good books. I enjoyed them. I'm not sure they were boring or not, maybe, but uh, I, I've never read any of the rule books, so I can't speak to that. I just went to sections of, that I liked. 
But something like that would be kind of cool, you know, and I don't... I, I wonder. We should, we're going to do a poll. In fact, um, Chuck, uh, Chuck just got us set up on something where we can start doing surveys and polls and crap like that, which is going to be pretty cool. I'm pretty, I'm pretty stoked about it. Because I like information, I like to know what other people, you know, what all of you guys out there, how you like the game, blah blah blah. blah. Um, but I'm gonna do a poll on who actually runs frequent Overland. I'm making a note here on my speaker. Uh, that would be interesting. I'd like to know how many people do dungeons, dungeons as compared to polls. I will. I will have you all know though. These are all. <laughs> these are my notes. Here's the poll. Uh, let's see. That's actually from the Greyhawk game. Here's some comments on the dice making, dice rolling videos. Uh, some giveaways. I think we got some mugs to give away. Something about wallpaper, desktop wallpaper. Uh, here is a smart ass comment I made in a meeting. So that could be thrown away too. It, everyone was talking, and I, so I wanted to make this smartest comment, so I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. <laughs> so then I probably made it. Uh, I can't read my handwriting. Shout out to Vicky. This is about screens, and I didn't do that. Damn it. That needs to go there. That's about the UV coating the screen, so we can get the screens back in. Uh, CKG notes, CKG notes. There you go. There you go. Too much stuff. All right. Uh, let's see. I have been reading the suggestions on using criticals and CKG. What do you use? Uh, I go real simple. Real crazy simple on the, the crits. I never use those charts. If you roll a natural 20, you do maximum damage plus 1d4 and uh, plus your strength and magic and whatever else. Uh, and if you roll a 1, it's a fumble. Uh, you drop the weapon unless you've got it like if it's a mace and you have a noose on your wrist. If it's a bow, uh, I'll roll a d6. If it's a 6, it's the string. If it's a 1 through 5, then the arrow broke. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Vice versa. If it's one through five, the string broke. If it's a six, the arrow broke. Uh, and that's how I do it. And it, it makes the game go really fast. We don't have to open the charts and look at anything and have people roll percentiles. Um, in combat, I like things to go crazy fast. So that's what I do there. I got a game running next week, don't I? We need more overland. There are a lot more possibilities than dungeon crawls all the time. There really is. I mean, uh, it, it's so much. It's so much more. It's crazy when you're doing Overland. Mine's probably, I would say, 95.5. I do Overland so much. Uh, so much, it's crazy. Mr. Obadiah, we've been doing max damage plus a D4. Seems to be fair without overpowering. Yeah, it's my favorite. It's just so easy. You're falling in love with Overland. It's running the seas right now, and it's been a joy. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yeah, that's actually that C1. All of those are adventures that we play, you know, at my table, and then I wrote them up and kind of went through it like that. But... <coughs> um, I don't know, and, and that's kind of a good example because there's little dungeons sprinkled throughout, encounters all over the place, overarching themes that you can carry from one adventure to another. It's just, I've always been fascinated with, like, mountain men um, when they, they, they knew, you know, if you wandered around Colorado in 1820, 48, for five or six or seven years, you're going to know all the little creeks and all the mountains. And I, look, I like that idea. I like that someone can turn to Aragorn and get the answer to the question. Uh, it's just kind of cool. Here's what I almost said. <laughs> I'm not sure what I mean. Dungeons are great, but they, they get kind of boring. They, for me, they get very boring. There's more than like 10 rooms. I get very, very bored because I can't describe anything different. Honestly, less rules, the better. Like an actual survivor guide that mixes real-world survival techniques and fantasy elements would be awesome, just as the reference guide. So you're looking for food and, and arid foothills, what all can be found in this sort of terrain. How? Yeah, no, you're spot on. How do you cut a, co a, a cactus... Uh, to avoid spillage, how can you tell if what? No, I think that would be badass. That would be cool. It's sort of a little bitty bit what we tried to put in in the adventures backpack in the two pages that we discussed mounts. I wanted to know, I wanted to know more about the mounts than the actual rules. There's one chart I think on how much roughage you need to feed them, uh, stuff like that. But uh, that type of information for me is the best. Um, because then I can just let my imagination go and me and the players can build off of it, whatever whatever the heck we want. But I'm, I'm looking up something in the Adventures Backpack. I never knew this, and when I was researching this, this thing, I, I, I learned this word, and I'm sure some of you already know it. 
but um, it's the, this is the type of stuff that I would want to see in a wilderness survival guide. Withers. Withers is the ridge of an animal between the shoulder blades. I never knew that. I'd heard that term a thousand times growing up, but I never knew that that's what it actually meant until I researched for that book. And, and when I read that, it's like, oh, that's going to the book. Uh, that's the type of stuff I think would be cool to have in a wilderness survival guide. Uh, that stuff would just be pretty awesome. Especially Chuck Stunt's <laughs> My Perfect Orlando's to Defend Your Camp. Those can be extremely fun, especially at night. You can make a whole session from just a night watch. Absolutely. And the cool thing about the dark is how very, very dark it is and how sound carries differently at night, especially in the forest or the mountains. It's just really cool. I shouldn't say it carries differently. It just It's more enhanced, I guess, because you can't see. Uh, the Encyclopedia of Old Land Adventure for Discerning Crusaders. <laughs> there you go. Love your titles there, Kothar. <laughs> These 18th century titles that are basically a, a synopsis of the book before you <laughs> before you open it. <laughs> the poor adventures, James Bond books. There you go. Yeah, I don't know. I think uh, I think that type of stuff would be kind of cool. I, I like material that that doesn't guide the way I game, but enhances what I'm doing. And that what you're talking about, Kothar. That that's kind of the. Uh, that's kind of the point, I think. That's what we tried to do in the CKG. Most of that is just kind of, you know, additive to your game. Have some rules in there for sure, but in some charts and some guidelines and whatever. But, but by and large, it's just an additive. <sighs> How's it going, Lord Gazumba? Surely did enjoy your game uh, this past weekend. That was awesome, dude. You, you managed that uh, very, <laughs> very well. You're, you're clearly very comfortable with the camera and getting everybody kind of zoomed in and whatnot. You even you even made allowance for my bifocals, so <laughs> so that was awesome. <laughs> we had to defend our patrol base from a gaggle of raccoons. <laughs> yeah. well, raccoons can be extraordinarily aggressive. How do I go to the bathroom in sub zero weather? Oh yeah, there's all kinds of interesting stuff in there. Nice new throw you've got over the armchair in the background. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, that was made by noble noble dwarf. It is fantastic. Uh, I'm thinking uh, it would be on the high end of things, but it's made of a, an extraordinarily durable canvas, right? So it's a poster board uh, made of this crazy good canvas. If I can hang it up here. Uh, those, those guys, are, I think it's Noble Dwarf. Uh, they do a fantastic job. But uh, let me get that on there. I'm going to scratch it. Damn it. You still have a paper There you go. But anyway, so that's what we're kind of, we're, we're talking to them about these things. Very good stuff. I wonder about it. I see Stephen. Yeah, I do too, King Coker. I'm right there with you. Steve, Stephen, Chuck, and all TLG, thank you so much for the generous swag bag. You're welcome. Extort, very much appreciate And y'all jumping in and enjoying Lord Gazumba's convention. That stuff was awesome. That thing was pure awesome. Uh, they put on a great show. And it's nice too, as we all, as we all wander into this virtual convention world. Though I have to admit, I'm kind of missing the, the cons. Uh, yeah. Yes, Kadora, very carefully. I'll, I'll, I'll wreck just about anything. Or oh, the Foxfire books in here. There you go. Love those Foxfire books. I still have a few around here somewhere. Just That's what we need to do. We need to get a hold of the guys who did that uh, that series and take the relevant stuff and put it into a, a survival guide book. That would be awesome. <laughs> cool, you can make a player's version of a GM screen on one of those as a tabletop protector. You know... Um, we're, that that piece that Jason Walton did is so spectacular that that may end up screens. I don't know. I'm just so stoked with that thing. Uh, I didn't, you know, Tom Tullis and I, and that's I'm pretty sure that was Tullis's idea. We were talking about the eighth printing and whatnot, and he, he said something about, you know, we never really pitch Castles and Crusades as an OSR game. Yeah, Castles and Crusades predated the OSR movement, it's kind of what led into it because a lot of the guys that were in on the playtesting of CNC went on to do their own systems. Matt Finch did Sword and Wizardry and whatnot. And it's all great stuff. But uh, I, I never really, from a company perspective, from a marketing perspective, we've never really discussed CNC in terms of OSR. So I've never really looked at that. Um, but Tullis and I were talking a couple months ago. Uh, about just that and he said look man you need to do blah 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 he had some great ideas uh, and I'm not sure if that was his idea to do this kind of homage to uh, homage 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 
eh, sounds like tribute <laughs> to this tribute to uh, I should try not to speak French based words this uh, tribute to the old world and that player's handbook cover not only is it iconic but I love it that player's handbook cover from the old days has this well, it's Trampier, and he had this feel of mystery about it. You know what I mean? When you're looking at it, um, you're kind of drawn into it in this shadowy esque type thing, like you're uh, like you're seeing something as it's unfolding. I don't know. It's just a great piece of art. Uh, it's evocative without being, you know, over overly done or overly. Any, it's just a very good piece. So I sent it to Jason, and I said, "Hey, I'd like to do a tribute to this." A parody, whatever you want to do. I kind of, when it comes to Peter and Jason, I don't and Zoe, I don't give too much instruction. Uh, a little bit, I, I kind of let them go with what they're what they're doing. And then he sent me this sketch up, and I couldn't. I looked at the sketch, and I'm like, ah, it's great. I don't know. <laughs> There's not got colors in it. I don't know what's going on. So I sent it back. Said, yeah, it's fine. And then he he hammered it out in about ten days, and and holy Carolina, that that piece. And if you haven't seen it, let me. Well, we got it on a landing page. I'm just gonna put. I got that open. So I'm just gonna put the landing page for the Kickstarter here, and definitely check this thing out. Um, and you have to go to my Facebook page, I think, to see a bigger picture of it. But it's, it's just fantastic. He just did a, a great job. But he he deviated enough from the original that it's its own piece, and I think that's what really Jason wanted to do. Uh, Jason wanted to deviate and do his own kind of take on it, and it's uh, it's just man, it turned out absolutely fantastic. Uh, let's see. Sorry, I tried to get you and <laughs> That's all right, extort. <laughs> Poor old Fritz. Who killed Fritz? Wasn't that, um... That's Chuck's character, right? <laughs> that was Chuck's character. That was a fun game. That was an awful fun game. How's it going, Athelstan? Yeah, good stuff. Uh, let's see. What are we doing? What are we doing? All right, cool. You could make a player's version of a James... Anyway, he said... I'm kind of curious if all the Dr. Pepper in the world disappeared and you had to pick a different soda, what would it be? Have you ever even tried another kind of soda <laughs> on Squirt? You know, no, yes. I, I used to drink uh, root beer and orange. I don't know if it was Crush. I swear there was a different... There's Sunkist and Crush. It had to have been Crush. But I, when I was a kid, I used to drink Crush out of a bottle, and that's I've told the story about how, I've, how I got into Dr. Pepper. My grandfather, when they were at our root beer and Crush, I ended up, he said, try that Dr. Pepper. Uh, but uh, no, I, I drank Sunkiss for a little while, but it's always been Dr. Pepper. If I had a second soda, if I had to replace, and I will drink occasionally Coke, Coca Cola. It's good out of an eight ounce bottle or on ice. I don't like, I don't ever drink Dr. Pepper on ice unless I absolutely, absolutely, absolutely have nothing else to drink. And I mean, water, <laughs> I don't have any water. Then I'll drink Dr. Pepper on ice. Um, I don't like it in a fountain cup, I don't like it in a soft cup, I don't like it. <laughs> that sound like green eggs and ham, dude. Um, Dr. Pepper in a can is how I do it. But if I want, like, like, if I'm eating pizza, I always drink... <laughs> I'm such a weird son of a bitch. If I'm eating pizza, I always drink Coca-Cola over ice with pizza. It just tastes good. I don't know, the ice and the Coke and the pizza, it just it works well together. But, um, so my second runner-up would be Coca-Cola over ice. Out of a, out of a can... Ah, man, I don't know. I'd have to give up soda. <laughs> I did have to, when I was on deployment uh, on Kauai after the hurricane, chew that place up. I, there was no Dr. Pepper to be found anywhere. I ended up drinking Jolt Cola. I think they're out of business. I would never recommend <laughs> Jolt Cola to anybody. I drank it for about a week. I drank it for about a week until, because I traded it. This is, this is, the, way, <laughs> this is the way I lived in those days. When, I, when, we, when we deployed to Kauai, Kauai had been destroyed by a hurricane. I mean, just wrecked. When we deployed, one of my jobs was to drive up and down and kind of make notes for my sergeant major to see who needed what. And I pull up to the Budweiser plant, where a warehouse, I don't think it was a plant, but it was a warehouse. And their fencing was all down. There's beer and shit everywhere. And uh, they asked if I could give them a cot and a sleeping bag and some MREs so that they could have a guard there. Well, I wasn't authorized to do any of that. But what I did do... So I gave them my cot and my sleeping bag and my MREs out of the, the bag of the cut V. And in turn, they gave me, like, I don't know, six big boxes. You know, you know just the, like, yay box of, of, um, of Jolt Cola. 
I stored it under, when I got back, I pulled out the cut V and I put it in the deuce and a half and I put it all under the seat of the deuce and a half. We drank it for about a week. We had about two, two of the cases left or whatever the hell it was. When Leeper, my, uh, one of my, the guys in my section was back in the deuce and a half up, but he didn't close the door. Leeper was an idiot. He didn't close the door and I could, everyone was screaming, Leeper, 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 because the soda was falling out and he was just running it over. The soda was just pouring out of the side of the door. He crushed like, I don't know, 90% of it. So that ended my... My brief career with Jolt Cola, but uh, <laughs> it was funnier to share. But yeah, I, I eventually got my stuff back. Those guys are super nice and super, <laughs> super happy that they can have a guard out at the Budweiser plant for obvious reasons. Oh yeah, I can go there. A, a big printed copy of the Super Bowl TLG logo, you know the one. Oh yeah, that's a great idea. Did I miss something? I was in a figs and I saw the CNC box set of the core books for one of the earlier prints and, had it, and it had that giant logo on the side and I almost bought it. Yeah, I love, you're talking about the sword through the dragon, um, through, through the skull and the dragon wrapped around. I love that piece. Absolutely love it. We're going to do something with that. That Kickstarter, actually, got to talk to Chuck and Tim about that here very soon. We're going to do something with that specifically in this Kickstarter. The cover also tells a story and covers our uh, every aspect of the early game in a single image. Combat, engineering, exploration, deciphering maps, dead lizardmen, and looting treasure that has an obvious implication of a brutally deadly trap. Yeah, it really, you're right. And it's got this... The, the thing that I love about this piece is there's these are people. There's no there's no Arnold Schwarzenegger here, right? These are just adventurers. They're normal. They're more, obviously more than the average person, but they're no, there's nothing spectacular, outrageous, Gandalf the White or whatever. These are just people, and I and I love that. That's kind of how I see when I'm running a game. That's how I see the the people that I'm running, the players. Yeah, it's rare until they get. You know, really high level. I don't see them as these these huge things. So that piece really for me, uh, I opened it was just thunderstruck. Immediately sent it to Tom Tellus. Tell Tellus is my uh, my go to guy for all of these things, and uh, immediately sent it to him, and he went ape shit over it, and that made me go ape shit over it even more. So <laughs> Tellus is good people. If you don't know who Tom Tellus is, he owns uh, Fat Dragon Games. Uh, if you do not know who Fat Dragon Games is, you you should go to their shop. I'm going to put the link up here in a second. I don't know where Chuck and Tim are. I've kind of lost them. Um, let me get that in there. Fat Dragon Games. Uh, definitely check out anything and everything they do. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> There's Chuck. I see him. Can we get Tom to do a 3D file control? Like, that would be awesome. Um, that's an interesting idea. I wonder how long that would take him. Probably, <laughs> probably longer than he's willing to give me since I bought him a hamburger without pickles on it, so <laughs> he hadn't let me hear the end of it. Uh, Mr. Pibb. I don't know, King Kothar. <laughs> I don't know if I could do Mr. Pibb. <laughs> so he's no doctor. Yeah, exactly. Fritz didn't die. He was just resting his eyes. Yeah. <laughs> Kurt Crush was good. Uh, I don't even... Do they still make it? And Crush in a glass bottle with something else now. Uh, Crush is just... It's just a little sweet. You know, it's like root beer. I actually really like a root beer about once a month. I just want a root beer. But man, root beer is sweet. But that's good. Frosty. Was there a frosty orange drink? I can't remember. Too long ago. Uh, Mr. Pibb is a bullshit copy. <laughs> Get his degree. Yeah, exactly. I can't. I can't do Mr. Pibb. I just can't. I'll drink water first. Fago for us folks, originally from Michigan. Fago. I don't think I've ever heard of that. That's interesting. It's like uh, what do we keep hearing from New England? Um, ah, damn it. What is it? Everyone's something. Moxie. Moxie up in New England. Do you like it in a moat or do you like it in a boat? Exactly. <laughs> I gotta have root beer when eating Mexican food. Now that's interesting. I wanna try that. I like root beer, like I said a minute ago, like once a month. I'm gonna try that, Lucid. That's interesting. Get some tacos, have a root beer. Ah, I'll try it out. Oh man, now that's interesting, haunted with cold milk and pizza. I've never tried that, but I love cold milk. I, uh, when I was like 10 or 8, my aunt, who I loved dearly, still do, Aunt D, she's a fantastic woman. I always wanted to stay at her house, but she milked the thing to drink, but I wouldn't drink it because I didn't like it. So she started putting ice cubes in it and get the milk really cold. And that, since that day, I drink milk with ice in it, or I keep in my own fridge, I keep frosted mugs, mugs that get frosted. So I pour the milk in the mug, and I get this super ice cold milk. Absolutely. I absolutely love cold milk. Oh, I, I drink at least a mug of milk a day. I love milk. Uh, RC was was what we had. Oh yeah, RC. They still make RC, right? I just don't think it's available down here, but I think it's still out there. I remember RC. That's a long time ago. Jolt. I miss Jolt. Yeah, Boffer and I don't miss the Jolt. <laughs> <laughs> I 
that's funny. It, it, I would say it had it had a jolt of cola. I will, I will give you that. That thing knocked your socks off. Would you drink it or a coat or had an ice cream as a float? All right, blood wild. Wait, no, you're not Bedford. I think I had started started thinking KFC immediately. I only get cherry Ch- cherry coke at the th- movie theater. Oh, that's interesting. See, now I love coke and popcorn too. If I'm eating popcorn, which I do most nights, I, I have the popcorn maker and slather it with butter. You know, I'll make a couple of bowls and. Cover it with salt, butter, and sit there and drink a small little bitty Coke. I don't like much of it. And eat some popcorn. I will eat popcorn, Dr. Pepper, though. Often they still... Do they really? I thought they... I thought Jolt was gone. <laughs> Gondoria, I certainly did not drink Jolt for the taste of it. It was pure opportunity on my part. You were stationed in Ohio. I was born in... Co- Co- Kailu, Kailua, Kailua. Right, it's been so long since I pronounced uh, Hawaiian names. Yeah, I served in the Army in Hawaii from 1991 through 93, so I was there for a little about two and a half years. Schofield Barracks. Um, I went to the Big Island on deployment a couple of times, and I went to when the hurricane chewed up Kauai in 93, 92. Uh, I deployed to Kauai and helped the, you know, as much as we can help those people get things back together. Absolutely love Hawaii. It's a beautiful state. The people are crazy friendly. The weather is bizarre. It's just bizarre because it, it's just blue. <laughs> it's just blue and warm all the time. Occasional rain, but it's just blue and warm. It's very nice. I strongly recommend, if you can ever do it, take a vacation to Hawaii and enjoy yourself for like a week or two. I'm just joining in here, but I got to say, Mexican Coke out of the bottle is pretty magical. Okay, so Chad Skills is spot on. Now, I'm not sure where you guys are from, but we get, uh, in the Kroger here, we get the, is it 16? No, it's the 18. It's the big bottles of Coke that's bottled in Mexico. And it's made with, I believe, and correct me, Chad Skills, if I'm wrong, but I think it's made with imperial sugar, real sugar, that's not whatever we do up here to our food stuffs, you know, or put, I don't know what we do. It's just crazy. It's good. That Coke is good. That Coke is good. Get it good and cold. It is good. Yeah, that's a good point. I love that. I don't get it often. I don't know why. I don't really think about it. And you, you, it's in a special section at Kroger. It's not even in a soda pop section. It's like in the, it's like in the spices section, which is really strange. But um, yeah, yeah, that stuff's good. That's good. Shit, I'm gonna have to go get some after the stream. <laughs> I used to drink Shasta. Uh, Tim used to drink Shasta, right? Tim wasn't wasn't you a Shasta drinker? Crystal Pepsi is back apparently. Oh, good lord! Never been able to do the Pepsi stuff. My oldest brother, Pepsi drinker all the way. Davis, Coke drinker. Um, me and my sister, Dr. Pepper drinkers. But um, Pepsi I could never get into. Just too sweet. It would be a ton of work, but to have the characters on the cover be the characters in the book. Uh, hmm. It's an interesting thought, Ultra Magna. Hmm. It's kind of too late for that, though maybe not. Let me look at That's an interesting thought. Let me, let me ponder that. We've got art for the classes coming in. And I'm actually kind of thinking, I'm beginning to think out, out, out of my original zone of this book. So I'll take that into consideration. That's an interesting thought. Uh, Fat Dragon also has a great selection of dr- on drive through games. Absolutely. Yeah, true, wherever you can get Fat Dragon stuff, is great. Uh, it's, it's 3D printable terrain and paper terrain. You can make all kinds of shit. They got monsters now. It is, his windmill is through the roof, badass. Just Fat Dragon, Fat Dragon, Fat Dragon. Uh, I can have the logo CNC in wood. Interesting haunted holler. So what we're doing right now... Mr. Fib is a mimic. <laughs> That's right. Mr. Fib is a mimic. Um, we're trying to get it put in a bat uh, right now. Very small bat. I'm trying to get it done for the Kickstarter. i got to send got to send that guy an email uh, here after the stream. But um, it's so finely detailed that he's having trouble getting, getting to actually translate. So we'll see how that plays out. Uh, I, I love the concept of all of that stuff. Uh, let's see. Hold on. i got a question over here. All right. Uh, so Lawrence Davis has been in a been a bad boy. Has <laughs> he been giving his much? <laughs> he got booted off of Facebook for something. <laughs> I'm not sure what he did. Uh, I think he got. He can't run ads. He's he can post now, but he can't do something. I have no idea. I will say this. So we're going to do a special stream tomorrow, uh, based on the Kickstarter. Talking about the Kickstarter itself. I'm not sure of the time yet. I think at eight o'clock. 
8 in the evening, and Davis is going to be here. So if you can, <laughs> swing by it and join us. The Fago is the top tier stuff. It's everywhere here in Michigan. Well, I'm going to check that out. Moxie is the bomb. There you go. You can get Moxie at Cracker Barrel. Oh, I'll check Moxie on a Cracker Barrel. Can you get Can you get Fago at Cracker Barrel, maybe? I love Cracker Barrel. I absolutely love that place. They have great breakfast. Oh. <laughs> I'm an idiot. <laughs> All right. Okay, there you go. Uh, see, I've never seen you eat a taco in 30 years. <laughs> you know, Tim, I only eat a taco about once a month. <laughs> a taco is basically just a really hard hamburger. <laughs> that's really, it's just, it's ground beef and lettuce and cheese. And that's all I have on my taco. And, um, <laughs> and the, the, the chip, whatever that, the taco. I don't know whatever that thing's called. Taco shell. Uh, but, uh, so it's basically just a hamburger with a hard shell. It's like if you took a hamburger and you let the, the burger, the bun part just get stale and then you eat it. It's good. The taco tastes better than stale bread. So now, I will eat tacos once in a while. Uh, that's about it. But, it, but now I'm going to have to have a taco with a Coke purchased from <sighs> Kroger. I see, I've never... <laughs> When you're back for Gary Con, st stop by Sprecher's for a root beer float. Oh, yeah, I'll do that, Mark, definitely. Love root beer. Love root beer floats. Love ice cream. Man, do I like ice cream. I really like ice cream. Uh, nobody who watched that episode will ever be able to say radish. <laughs> you think Kirk Mona's John love his voice? Oh, yeah, no, it was great. That was fantastic. And I'm going to do something with radishes in the world of air. What Extort is talking about is the game uh, that we, we did, um, that Lord Gazumba did, over on his channel for Greyhawk Con on Saturday. I don't know. Sunday? Someday. I'm not sure what day. Um, and I was in it and Chuck was in it and uh, Eric Mona from Paizo over the Pathfinder folks was in it and Eric Mona's <laughs> role playing was through the roof, roof spectacular. I mean, it was, if you want to rate something 1 to 10, 12 easily. He's just, it was brilliant. First time I've ever got to play with Eric Mona, I was just pure joy. Uh, I loved it. RC Cherry, Cherry Coke. There you go. Fanta. Fanta's pretty good. Yeah, Fanta was alright. I remember that. I had that Fanta in forever. Can't remember what quality about Fanta. Yeah, Fanta's good. Nutritional yeast is honestly satisfying when added to popcorn, I swear. <laughs> I don't even know. I don't even know where that comes from, Chad Skills. <laughs> but, but I'm going to take your word for it. I don't cook at all. So I, I don't know what anything goes where or what. Um, I really don't even know how the human body works. <laughs> so people will say things about their organs, and I don't know. I had to, I had to have get Jason Vade give me a complete explanation of, of diabetes and the pancreas and all that stuff. I had no idea what any of that, anything did with anything. I love popcorn. Absolutely love popcorn. Uh, it, it is literally one of the, if it's buttered properly, it's one of the best tasting snacks and most annoying snacks. Because you get that one in kernel that sticks to the roof of your mouth and you can't get it off for, for the life of you. Just found it in my town. Is it at Dollar General? Ah, oh, that's interesting. You know, they got all kinds of crazy shit at, at Dollar General. You should not pass them up, especially in toilet paper shortages. Not once did I see Dollar General run out of TP. Our, our grocery stores did, but the Dollar General never did. <clears throat> uh, yeah, it, it was a great game, next door. It was fantastic. It made it, It's made with cane sugar. There you go. Yeah, that stuff is good. It's rich. Now, if you're not used to cane sugar, there's a little bit of adjustment. Because it's... I don't know what we do with our sugar. I don't know if we put additives in it or refine it. I have no idea. I don't know anything about any of that. But I do know that when you when you get pure sugar, it's, it's a little different. Is it the corn syrup? Do we put corn syrup in these things? Is that what we're doing now? I don't know. Is that how we get... It's got to have sugar in it, doesn't it? Hell, I don't know. It's too small to read. Yeah, that's that's got to be it. It's got to be the sugar. All right, so so this does this have corn syrup? Is that what they're doing now? Is they, they've taken our sugar away, the bastards. Although canned Coke in Mexico still has corn syrup. I wonder if it's bottled maybe in Texas. That's interesting. Hmm. They may have a special bottling plants. It's getting harder and harder to find things in glass bottles, which is a shame because glass, I think, I'm an idiot, but I don't know, is better for the environment. It keeps it colder. Uh, it's just... All the way, you can recycle the thing. You can reuse the thing. It's just all the way around better. Whatever idiot created the, the plastic bottle, uh, 
He ruined the taste of Dr. Pepper. He made water lukewarm for the rest of our lives. And he's just an idiot. <clears throat> or she. I don't know. I, you know I don't, who I, Good God. Uh, I was just told there's a guild in Warcraft called the Steve Project. <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. My dad would go through great pains to get Pepsi in the bottle. Yeah. If I can find... I, I only know one place that I can get Dr. Pepper in glass bottles, and that's in Monticello, Arkansas. It's about an hour and a half from here. And I'll go about once every couple months on a trip just to go get a six-pack of a Dr. Pepper in a glass bottle. Yes, real, real sugar, Stephen. And yeah, I'm craving myself now. <laughs> Damn your chat. I think they almost always have them at Kroger. I have not seen them since the whole COVID mess, but I haven't looked, so they're probably still sitting there. I can't imagine why that would stop arriving. There's no mad rush on Coke to buy on a bottle of Coke from Mexico. I wouldn't think. Maybe. I don't know. The trick to great Coca-Cola is add powdered crack hockey cocaine. <laughs> yeah, there you go. It's funny you should say that, Ken Coder. I literally last night just watched the documentary that's on, I don't know what, uh, Netflix maybe? Hulu? Is it Hulu? I don't know. Um, it's like this three-hour documentary of the history of food. It goes, covers cornflakes, post-cereal, shit like that. But it's got Coca-Cola on there and how they used to have cocaine in there. Uh, there's a burger. It, it, there's. I did find out that Coke is the only company that can legally import cocoa leaves because because they still have some kind of extract from it. There's a burger place in LA that has them. Literally a perfect combo. Oh nice. Oh yeah. All right. Next time in LA, chats, because I'm gonna give you a shout. <laughs> and we're gonna go have a burger at that place. I, if you don't know, I'm a huge fan of cheeseburgers. I. I love cheeseburgers. I love hamburgers. I will eat them all week. If I could. My mom liked Pepsi mixed with milk. Oh, now that's interesting. Sometimes with chocolate syrup. Huh. Never seen Pepsi cut with milk or milk cut with Pepsi. I'm not sure how that would go. Oh, that's interesting. When New Coke crapped down in the U.S., <laughs> they sent it overseas, and that was all we could get. Oh, my God. God, New Coke was horrible. It was just horrible. I am craving radishes. <laughs> Quesadilla, Mexican grilled cheese. There you go. Uh, tacos are basically just harder hamburgers. <laughs> well, you know, it's just hamburger meat. <laughs> turkey Hill ice cream. I've not had Turkey Hill yet. I eat Bluebell. That's my out of Texas. Good stuff. Fanta red cream soda. Now that just sounds good, Tim. Was it Fanta? You drank Fanta forever, right? Or was it Shasta? Now I can't remember. I can't. It was one of the two. Welcome to today's stream. Steve's favorite cuisine. To, yes, soda. Jim. I'm sure we're talking about sodas. Most of what we're talking about and, and cheeseburgers. Second ingredient is corn syrup. Ah, bastards. That's just funny. That's a shame. <laughs> you know, yep, there it is, corn syrup. High fructose. You know, I would invite him in here if you all wanted some some <laughs> some crazy lecture. Mark Sandy, when he used to work for here full time. Now, Mark's a, a lovely guy. I love him to death. A very smart, super smart guy. Uh, guy has an engineering degree. He's good at mathematics and all of this stuff. He's just a great guy. But, but he had a real hang up about corn syrup. He was just, there's corn syrup and everything. It's, it's just, it's in our gasoline. It's in our food. It's, they've got corn syrup. It's the corn syrup industrial. He, he really didn't like the whole corn syrup thing. Hey, man, everybody's got to have their thing, right? They stopped using cane sugar because of the cost, so they switched to the cheaper corn syrup. However, now that the price of corn is skyrocketing, don't be surprised if they eventually switch back. That'd be nice. They have bottled Dr. Pepper at Costco in cases. Are you shitting me? In cans? I mean, in bottle glass? In glass bottles, Epi? I may have to come down there and see you. Do you have a Costco down there? Holy Carolina. I gotta come down there. See, the, the, my favorite restaurant that I've ever eaten at is in a, in a place called Tatum, New Mexico. The burger barn, yeah, it, literally the best hamburger I've ever eaten in my entire life. Um, and when my son asked for for breakfast without anything but bacon, they brought him a plate of bacon. Like it was just it was crazy. Um, so I'm thinking maybe I need to go to Tatum get a burger, stop by Costco and get a couple of cases of glass Dr Pepper. Burgers never say die. It's amazing and yeah, hit me up. Absolutely, dude. Now I'm obviously COVID. Blah blah. Um, but I was doing uh, one to two trips a year to L.A. We got business out there that we're trying to kind of foster, so I need to get back out to L.A., so I may be calling to you. <laughs> I may be calling you to go get a burger somewhere in L.A. Um, actually, you know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a guy from Arkansas. I'm raised in the Army and all that stuff, But and you hear all kinds of crazy shit about Los Angeles. The people there were crazy friendly. Uh, it's, I didn't have any problem getting around. A little busy, a little traffic-y. 
I don't know, freeways everywhere. You can drive really fast. No one gives a shit. <laughs> I don't know. LA was pretty cool. I recommend, you know, go hanging out a little bit. It's pretty cool. Uh, probably wait till the pandemic does finish this doing whatever it's doing. Any advice on crafting a unique system for an RPG? Uh, well, Anzig, um, first off, um, get a couple of guys that you're playing with and just start running. Just run ideas before you kind of marry anything up. My my gaming style is a little different than most in that I, I like things to be very fast and simple. I don't want really complicated and rules mechanic y stuff. And though some people love that stuff. So probably what you gotta do is kind of figure out what you love the most, sit down with your buddies and then just start kind of testing pieces of it. So if you're playing C and C or D D or whatever game you're playing, take out this bit and test it. So so like this uh, critical hit that we do in Castles and Crusades where you, if you roll a natural 20, you do maximum damage plus a d4. That's a rule that I came up with back in the 80s. Well, it, it's so easy and it's so streamlined and it's so, I don't know, it gives the players a really nice bump to their to their hit that it became kind of part of the Castles and Crusades game. So when you're sitting there and you're trying to come up with concepts and ideas, run the first of them, run them through the games that you're running now, whatever game that is, D&D, Pathfinder, Sword and Wizardry, Castles and Crusades, Thunderbolt Classic. <laughs> I'm trying to think of some RPGs. Uh, run them through there, and then start playtesting those, and then build build your game with that in mind. Now, if you if you've got some kind of particular mechanic that you're doing, uh, like it's a, um, a skill check mechanics or whatever, go ahead and bleed that into your game as well. Alter the game that you're having, and then just see how it goes. And you're sort of playtesting in a very comfortable, very secure environment. That's sort of where the Siege Engine came from. We did attribute checks that came out of uh, the Dungeoneers, or the Wilderness Survival Guide, the AD&D thing. Uh, and then we morphed those into just kind of a dice check behind my screen. I would just shout out whatever dice I saw, I'd roll a d4, and I would give it a target number without any kind of real conscious thought of every action needs a target number. Uh, and then that concept, Mac took that concept in Davis, and they really created this beautiful machinery that is the Siege Engine off of that. So it's something that we were playing AD&D, we were creating rules to make the AD&D our game, and then that became kind of a root which fed the tree, to, or the food that fed the tree that became Castles and Crusades. So that's the first thing that I would do, is get with your buddies, keep playing what you're doing, and then try these new rules out. The little ones and the big ones, try to weave them in, and eventually... Hopefully, if you start to kind of craft something that you really like and that kind of stands out and it gives you a different, gives the gamer a different angle, then you can say, okay, guys, let's, let's, let's try this mechanic tonight and then roll it out and see if it, see if it actually works. And that way, you're getting to kind of experiment with it while you're playing and you're in a very, I don't know, protected is not the word. I'm not sure what word I'm looking for, but you're in a good environment where you can kind of run it in and run it out and, and amend it without becoming super obsessed. I'm going to create an RPG. This is what I'm doing. I'm writing this RPG. Everybody play. You still want to have fun, uh, and if you run 10 games where you're trying to work a mechanic out, people aren't going to have fun. Some will, some won't. So my first advice would be to weave your rule set into whatever game you're playing now and then, and then pull the rule set out when it's matured enough that you think you can run some sessions. And go with it that way. Hope that helps. Search for Dr. Pepper Heritage with sugar. Looks like it comes in the vintage 70s box. Oh, nice. Very good. I remember when we used to talk about games. <laughs> Me either help and then we were talking about movies to start to fade too. Yeah, this has been a crazy uh, Dr. Pepper stream. <laughs> Nobody likes that. Anyway. A dump stat. But what ability score do you find least useful? No fear of saying depends on the classes. I mean across all classes. Uh, it's not charisma. I use charisma all the time. Understanding that I run games more than I do than I play. So from a CK's perspective, from a Game Master's perspective, um, let's see, Dex, I use, it probably going to be intelligence, I think. Um, and I think, and the, let me tell you why. Um, I think that a lot of the checks that, I, I have people make intelligence checks, but a lot of the checks that they have them make are kind of um, uh, broader checks and like if you're in a force and you're a ranger, and even if you're not making a track check, say you're making a listen check or whatever, you're going to have some kind of natural aptitude, and that's not really your intelligence. And I guess what I'm trying to say is 
most classes is pr- in, in castles and crusades most classes primary attributes kind of covers things that they know so for instance if the fighter is trying to discern what a c someone has uh or you know how tough they are i'm going to have him make a strength check because he's going to be he's going to be judging that person off of the armor his bearing and all of that crap you know that they got on there um okay we got something okay so at any rate yeah, so I think probably intelligence is the one that I dump the most. Charisma, because I do so many NPC actions, interactions. Charisma is the top of the dog. A lot, obviously, dex, strength, uh, con. Con would actually probably be my second dump step that I don't use that much. Uh, I absolutely love charisma. It's one of my favorite classes, my favorite uh, a- a- attributes, without a doubt. Um, let's see. Enzig, I hope I answered your question there. Uh, tacos with a beef patty, cheese, onion, and peas. A whole thing deep fried. Oh, man. <laughs> I think we're all getting ourselves very worked up over dinner now. <laughs> we're all going to be rushing out to eat Mexican food tonight <laughs> with some Mexican Coke. It's breakfast time here. Oh, well, there you go, Mr. Obadiah. You're on the other side of the world. And now I'm thinking about a trip to my local burger joint. <laughs> Put it off till 11. You'll be good. That's when I eat lunch every day is 11 o'clock. So, uh, <laughs> so I can get in there early. Yeah, green chili, <laughs> green chili cheeseburger are the best. Yeah, we're just we're just full on dinner now. Uh, I agree. Read the Omnivore's Dilemma by Michael Pollan. Crazy stuff. <laughs> yep, they have pallets of them. Because uh, I missed something. I missed. I missed okay, so I'm going to have to get that in a bottle. That's crazy. That's crazy. Have you heard Lewis Black's rant about corn syrup? We're using food for fuel. I'll, I'll send it to Mark. I have not, but I'll I'll listen to it to Dora and send it to Mark. His head will explode. Los Angeles is a special kind of crazy. I lived just south of there for 16 years. Yeah, I don't know. It's interesting. You know, it's just, I don't know. I, I frequently gauge a place that I go by the friendliness of the people. And everyone, everywhere I've gone in L.A. has been very friendly to me. So, uh, I, and, you know, I only went Hollywood Boulevard or whatever, downtown. I wandered around that area. And I, I stayed in Burbank quite a bit. So I wandered around Burbank. Uh, and then I hit some game stores somewhere. I don't know where. Uh, L.A.'s a big town. And then we wandered up, my daughter and I wandered up the coast, so. Tim, Tim, you were there too. You went with us. Me, you, and Rachel went up the coast. Uh, good stuff, though. Uh, Eddie Van Halen died. Oh, that's crazy. Uh, yeah, man, I'm a little, that's crazy. He just died? Uh, oh, he had cancer. That's horrible. Eddie Van Halen was the man. And we're going to do one. I got a bunch of announcements here in a second. I'm trying to catch up. So, Sidewinder, we're doing another another AMA or something. We're doing a Kickstarter special tomorrow. Uh, but I'm not having the painting show tomorrow so I can watch a debate with my kid. Is there a debate? Are the presidents debating again? The presidents. Like, we've got two. I, don't, <laughs> I haven't watched a presidential debate since Mondell and Reagan. They're, they just drive me crazy. Though I did catch a minute. I turned on the Biden-Trump uh, one. <coughs> I fell over laughing when I heard Biden call Trump a clown. That was so funny. All I thought to myself was, I love this country. I just love this country so much. Uh, by I'm not SC, <laughs> by the way. Uh, yeah, I think we're going to do something in place of your uh, show tomorrow there in Haunted. A question. In designing CNC, how did you get, did you guys approach the armor class concept, especially as it relates to dodging attacks? Do you like combining it all into an overall defense score like AC or as damage mitigation only something in between? So we wanted it to be very simple in the beginning, and we wanted it to appeal to a third edition player. So we kept the, the ascending armor class as it was presented in, in 3E. That was the primary goal there. Everything else we wanted supplemental. So uh, if you do a dodging mechanic, the minus four, that's something that's directly... I, I don't know if that's an ad and thing, but we definitely did it in my ad and game. Uh, I don't know if that's something we developed on, on our own, and then it came over... Uh, so that's what that kind of became. So all the other armor class rules were optional. If you don't want to use them, you don't have to. Uh, you just move on. And that's one of the things about CNC. We try to keep it as simple as humanly possible. Uh, with all that additive crap on there, I use it, of course. Uh, a lot of people do, but uh, a lot of people don't. Uh, but I, I generally will combine it all. But there's not really... I don't. There's not a lot that you can't do simultaneously. Uh, but yeah, I'll combine it into the AC, except like the the... The negative, the, the, the minus four on a dodge or a parry, I'll actually take that off my dice, which of course is the same thing. But, um, that's kind of how that plays there. I messaged Babunski about this on Discord, but I couldn't find any TLG dice in the shop. 
Are they hiding where I can't find them, or are there? T there are no TLG dice left. We sold out of both sets. I'm like 99% certain. Um, but we are, we are. Literally, Davis and I were talking about that problem today, and I think we've got a solution that we're going to be working on in, in the next couple of months. And so, hopefully soon. Technically, I'm all food is Mexican food. Bad <laughs> just Well, there you go. <laughs> Yeah, it's just all good food at this point. I don't, it's always kind of driven me a little crazy when people call it Indian food, and Mexican food, and Chinese. It's just food. It's just food. That's all it is. If it's Mugu Gai Pan, it's... Is that Chinese food? I don't know. Uh, it's the only Chinese food, actually. It's Mugu Gai Pan. I really like that. Well, I, I see, that's what I love about CNC. Super easy to make your own. Add and subtract rules. Add your own rules. It's all yours. Well, with it and how you want. Some game stuff. Yeah. That's the whole thing on CNC. We And that's one reason the Player's Handbook will keep the, the CKG section in it. Uh, it's just got to be simple. It just absolutely has to. I didn't make a pot of chili yesterday. <laughs> Steve, check your Facebook. Uh, do I need to do that now? What did I do? Did something explode? Uh, uh, and back. Dismiss where you <laughs> with the decap green tea. There you go. Or which Facebook? Haunted, are there messages? Okay, there we go. Daniel sent me a picture. Ah, oh, you bastard. What are you making? Oh, it's pork chops. Ooh, damn, that looks good. Ooh, you should post that here in the feed. <laughs> that looks delicious. That looks really good. I love pork chops. Yeah, I really... Tim, you know, I had a good time out there. It's a really good town. Hey, Skaggeth, how's this going? Instead of debating, they should just wrestle. <laughs> deal, deal. Imagine a wrestler. There you go. Bring out, the, bring out the real stuff. I don't know. The debates are just funny. I mean... And look, I don't, everybody watches them, that's fantastic, but they're going to say things to make you feel better, to make you vote for them. That's their job. That's what they're trying to do. Fantastic. Wonderful. I'm old enough to know that that's not the way politics works out. It's certainly shit not the way it works in a republic. If you've got a democracy, it might be a little different. We don't. Thank God we've got a republic. And that's not the way it works. The way it works is we vote for them, and they get to do what they want. And we get to vote them out in two to four to six years or whatever you're voting for. That's the way the Republic works. Uh, and I'm perfectly 100% happy with that. Let them do what they're doing so I can do, so I can make some gains, and they leave me alone, and I leave them alone. If the Soviets invade us, we can go do something. You know, I'll pick up a stick. But, but by and large, it's mostly I don't watch political speeches. I don't watch the president speak unless it's something like, like when the Challenger blew up and Reagan spoke, that that I watched. Uh, when Bush did his bullhorn thing on the, the, the ruins of the towers, that I watched. Um, but otherwise, presidents are just saying stuff that they they think you want to hear, and they're going to do about 10% of it, because that's all they're going to get through, because that's not the way our system works. So, uh, I mean, all of it. At the, <laughs> at the end of the day, at the end of the day, the, the United States Constitution has changed what, 27 times since its inception in 1791? And really that's not even fair because the first 10 times were part of the Constitution. One rescinded one of the others, so that's 12 that you can discount. Three were just to give people liberty, so that's that's really, that, sh that was already in the Constitution. It just kind of, you know, solidified all of it. So really we changed it like 10 times in 240 years. That's a pretty good score. Uh, so I'm happy with the Constitution and the politicians can go up there and cause whatever can ruckus they want <laughs> and talk and talk and the press can talk and talk and talk, whatever. So I don't, yeah. See, now you got me on a political rant. So I don't, I, it, it, the long story is I just don't watch the debates. <laughs> it's just a waste of a couple of hours. Uh-oh, am I in trouble? Uh, something's bending somewhere. Uh, oh, Steve, before I forget, I did find a super slick, almost immediate way to resolve all non rule specified dilemmas in games. Y'all might be interested. All right, fire it over. We're, we're wrapping the stream up, but this is we're going to fire it over with, <laughs> with Gothard's uh, solution to all. Good Lord, man. I'm going to have to move in with you. A lot of food. Oh, some good looking chicken. Woo. Now, pork chops plays out. So, how about those games? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, I'm pork chop over chicken haunted, but uh, the chicken looks good. Looks really good. At any rate, so this was the strangest AMA, I think. We mostly just talked about uh, Dr. Pepper and soda. <laughs> I think somehow that's how we ended up. Um, and it is a passion of mine, so there you go. Uh, but So we're waiting for King Kothar to close things out with the uh, I smoke everything. Mm, 
You probably should put some qualifiers on that, Daniel. <laughs> you should probably just add a couple of qualifiers there. Everything I eat, perhaps. Okay, so now I'm, I'm all over the butter. I love butter. I eat butter all day. Everything out of the cow is good. Milk, leather, butter, all of it. Okay, yeah, so while Kothar, <laughs> thanks, Pete. Um, so this is what we're doing. Tomorrow we've got a special stream. What time? What time, Chuck? I think it's 8. Chuck, is it 8? So tomorrow on Wednesday, Davis, my brother, will be here, and we're going to do a special stream for, we'll be talking about the Kickstarter and ask me anything, probably mostly talk about burgers and coke, but we will talk about the Kickstarter some. <laughs> yes, Chad, it is very much time to go get a hamburger, a <laughs> big-ass cheeseburger. Uh, so we got tomorrow at 8, we'll be doing a stream, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time. Davis will be here, so join us for that. He He's only made one stream, I think, since we've started this. And, of course, we'll be, we'll be doing GM's Tricks of the Trade on Thursday at 8, uh, and then we'll be back again next week, of course. Uh, blah blah blah. And tomorrow we're going we're going to do we are going to do two fifty dollar giveaways. Uh, Haunted Holler Paintings is off this week. We'll be doing his. We'll be doing our special stream during his time slot there. And definitely go check out the Kickstarter, Kickstarter landing page. Great stuff over there. All right. So what do, what do we got here, Kane? Uh, the rule is odds or evens. You have something you need to resolve, but couldn't be bothered to look at the rules or tabulate all the variables. Ask the player if they prefer odds or evens, roll the die. If the result matches their choice, the good result happens. If not, then no. It puts the agency in their shoes, and they feel like it wasn't dumb luck when it goes well, but don't feel robbed when it goes poorly. That's actually not a bad idea. <laughs> there you go. There's a great and easy way to resolve it all. <laughs> Doesn't matter about skill. It's all luck. Just go. Uh, and sometimes, sometimes life is about luck, isn't it? Sometimes it's, it doesn't. You can work as hard as you want. You can plan as hard as you want. You can do all of these things and think you deserve it all, and it still just doesn't work out. And then there's that idiot down the street that everything just works for just beautifully. It's just the way it is sometimes. All right, everybody. <laughs> Chad's got me all about Mexican Cokes and burgers. I'm going to go uh, find a burger <laughs> and call it a day. Uh, thanks, everybody, for showing up for the stream. Please join us tomorrow night at 8 p.m. Uh, we'll try to get all the trolls in here, and we'll talk about the Kickstarter and Dr. Pepper and soda and hamburgers and <laughs> whatever else comes up, and uh, have a good time. So we'll see you tomorrow night. And uh, again, Jim's Tricks the Trade on Thursday. Uh, take care, everybody. Thanks a lot. This is a blast. You guys are the best. If I can figure out how to stop. There we go. All right. I can spin in my screen so I don't... <laughs>